Hi everyone and welcome to Weco Combos with Dan. We had a great conversation this time with Nick Zaccardi. Now Nick is from the Kendanga Farm Store and we talked about regenerative agriculture but we also touched, started talking more about the nutritional value of food and what it does for you. Nick being a, a nutritionist and dietitian, this was his area of expertise. Now what a wonderful chat it was, I'm sure you're going to get a lot out of it. Unfortunately we had some video difficulties so this episode is just going to be audio but you're going to get so much out of it. I hope you really, really enjoy. Anyway, I look forward to talking to you soon. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Eco Convos with Dan. I'm your host, Dan Vanderhoek, and we are here at Century 21 Platinum Agents in Gympie with Nick Zaccardi, and we are going to be talking about regeneration, self-sustainability, and the ideas of off-grid living here in our podcast. So, mate, thank you very much for coming along. Welcome. My pleasure. So, um, yeah, Nick, you know, uh, just wanted to tell us a little bit, bit of, about yourself, you know, mate. Um, we were talking before about the idea you've, you've moved up to Queensland about ten years ago, and yep. you know, doing a few bits and pieces, mate. If you don't, what's your history, mate? Yeah, so basically moved up from Queensland, um, as you said, about ten years ago with my family. Um, so when we moved up here, I finished high school, um, then we went to uni. I studied nutrition and dietetics. Okay. Um, graduated as a dietitian. And worked with Queensland Health for a while um, in a couple of roles. Worked as a you know clinical dietitian on wards, and also with the, within the community. Um, around the same time I was graduated, my um, parents bought a farm out here in uh, Widgee. Yeah. So you know while I was working there, you know I wasn't what I anticipated it was bit would be. Um, so then I decided to move back to the farm. Um, and try and make a go of it there, you know, yeah. grow some veggies, raise some livestock, raise some poultry. Um, so, yeah, basically ever since then I've, um, you know, worked on the farm. Um, each year we do, I, um, each year since moving back we're um, expanding, growing more veggies, you know, growing more um, poultry, producing more eggs. So um, just recently though I've now started working at Kendanga Farm Store. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is a um, really cool shop, um, really enjoy working there. It's, it's probably one of the only farm stores, rural supply stores in Australia focusing on regenerate, regenerative agriculture. Um, so basically rather than taking from your soil, building up your soil so you can produce healthier food with, uh, with less inputs. So. Yeah, yeah, so I mean regeneration is obviously such a, uh, a huge topic and um, you know, a number of people are going to be talking to about it. And I think... Something I want to uh, go on to a little bit more uh, tonight, today in this in this conversation we're going to have, you know, in what you guys have been doing with with that regeneration. You know, we were talking before about what that actually means and why it's so important to actually go through and and build the soil back up. You know, um, you know, can you, you get, get onto a little bit more about why it's why it's something that we have to do? What? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so when we look into you know. Conventional farming, uh, which is heavy on essentially killing things, yeah. um, whether it be with fungicides, pesticides, herbicides. Um, regenerative agriculture looks at more so working with nature and basing how we produce food on you know nature's model, which is yeah. you know, integrating livestock into your into your um, whether it be broad acre cropping or you know small crops, integrating livestock, not growing monocultures like which is a big thing, you know, um, you can have a huge um, a lot of broccoli, for example, mm. whereas but you have a pest come through and destroy that, you've lost all your crop. But if you were growing, you know, many different things, yeah. you have build resilience. Um, so, yeah, that's where you get diversity in, um, yeah, as I said, integrating livestock. Reducing or using no synthetic fertilizers, um, working with with nature um, to produce, you know, nutrient dense, healthy food. Yeah, I mean, that's really, really important these days. And you're seeing the the difference where people are actually going. They're they're doing more at, at home and seeing those benefits from their home garden. They're seeing, you know, the, the differences they're getting. Just not not even just uh, the you know the the act of doing it themselves and the, the idea of being able to save some money, which, you know, obviously we all yeah. want to do that, but the, 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 the flavor is different. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, it's, it's not, it's, um, you know, the, 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 it's, it really is the fruit of your labor. Oh, absolutely. 
Um, yeah, when we talk about better flavour, um, the better things taste, the more nutrients they've got in them as well. So they're more healthier for you. They're uh, helping you know you live a healthier life, reducing. Obviously, I've got a nutrition background. Um, so we looked at. I saw it all the time. You know, someone would be you know massively overweight, but they're still malnourished because they're not getting the micronutrients they need. Yeah. Um, it's an actually really interesting. It's a really interesting field of um, study. It's mainly called hidden hunger. But yeah, we'll get people in that have just such poor nutrient profiles in their you know, blood tests, and it's just yeah, crazy. Just because they're eating such poor foods, granted. They are a lot of heavily processed foods, but yeah. even still, you look at some of the vegetables today. I think I rem- remember uh, remember reading a study that showed that you, know, you need to eat uh, kilos of broccoli to get the same nutrient value as you used to do, you know, fifty, sixty years ago. So I think the interesting thing we're seeing these days is there's that push towards the organic section in, in the shops, and you know, is 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 that. Is, is there a big difference between that or is that just uh, your, your major food chains actually starting to ramp up the prices on their food a little bit? Or is, is, is the difference in that, that nutrient density that you were talking about, is that, is that a big difference in those areas? Well, honestly, it comes down to the producer. Yep. Um, so you can have massive, massive farms producing organic food, but the main difference is so for something to be certified organic, it has to be derived from a natural source. Um, so, for example... Um, a lot of, well, much of the fertilizers, for example, used in organics um, are ba- a lot of natural-based fertilizers. So your poultry manures, um, your soft rock phosphates, all that stuff derived from nature. So yeah, as long as the plant gets the nutrients it needs, whether it's from synthetic fertilizer or um, a natural source, they're still going to have similar. Um, nutrient profiles. So this is I'm talking about large scale production of organic foods. Yeah. Look, there may be there. There's plenty of data out there to show that a conventional cauliflower and an organic cauliflower have the same level of nutrient when you come to big broad scale acres um, farming. Um, but then you look at you know what has been applied to that plant. Whereas you know, and if has there been any uh, herbicides or pesticides, synthetic based pesticides used. On that farm, um, the biggest difference with organic farming is um, the holistic approach to managing. So you're getting the uh, improvements in soil health. Yeah. You've got more beneficial insects. Um, you've got uh, a, you're working with nature to uh, a whole e- ecosystem. So therefore, you've got less nutrient runoff. Um, which you know, I was talking to a, a guy who was working on the um, Great Barrier Reef. Um, project in, um, he's just in uh, somewhere in the Mary Valley anyway. Yeah. He, um, he did some trials and they've found sediment runoff from the Mary River in the Great Barrier Reef. So, wow. yeah, yeah, it's, it's crazy. But then, so that's very large scale agriculture. But then when you get down to smaller producers, um, I have no doubt that the nutrient density would be much, much higher. Yeah, yeah. Because um, you think about large farms, they're, they're there to make money. Of course. So they're going to put their inputs down as low as they can uh, just to get by. Uh, whereas you have the small-scale farmers, they're doing it for passion. They love it. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, obviously I'm not saying that large farmers don't love it, but, you know, they are often got funding from, they've often got money backing them from outside sources. And like any business out there, they need to make profit. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so, like, you know, you can do things like um, you can measure the, uh, I forget what it's called, the BRICS levels in um, plants, and the higher they are, you know, the more nutrients they are. So yeah. we've done, I've done some stuff on um, my farm, and when you compare, uh, like, tomatoes I've grown to store-bought tomatoes, even organically grown tomatoes, the BRICS levels are always much, much higher. Yeah. yeah. So their flavour is better, their shelf life is better, uh, and most importantly, the nutrient is yeah. better. So. When, you know, it is a bit misleading when you see these, you know, journal articles saying that oh, organic food is no better than conventional food, but in all fairness, it, I, in my opinion, is 100% better yeah. because you have to look at it holistically and not just from we one at, perspective. It's not, it's not just not just about how the, um, the food is, you know, when it's 
you, when, when it's on your on your plate, it's a, it's about how you're looking after the looking after your soil oh, and how you're looking, looking yeah. after your, you know where the food's coming from yeah, yeah. to be able to keep on you know ha- having it coming year after year after year. Exactly. Yeah, and like you know, you can have farms that are producing organic food that are just you know if they're using huge amounts of tillage, um, they're going to be losing soil carbon just as fast as the um, conventional farms. Yeah, uh, it just comes to just changing how it's managed. I think that you've, you've really um, set on a point there with the, the carbon, uh, the carbon side of things. That's really that's every conversation you get in with someone who is talking about you know being, you know actually you know the the soil and actually building the carbon into the soil is the number one thing. Yeah, that, they, that yep. they're doing. Yeah, so soil carbon is the key indicator to soil health. So the higher your carbon levels is, the healthier and more functional your soil is. Um, so carbon plays an essential role. It, you know, it's a food for microbes. It helps retain moisture. Yeah. Um, it helps with soil structure. Uh, it helps with nutrient. It holds nutrients, prevents them from leaching. Um, it, yeah, it just does a myriad of things in your soil. And, um, you know, it will plateau at about 9%, but then you just yeah. start testing deeper and yeah. then you start raising, you know, you test it at the root zone of the plant, which is, you know, 300 mil or whatever it is. Um, and then, yeah, you've got 9% carbon, which is fantastic. You've got healthy functioning soil. You've got microbes, you know, fertilizing your plants for you just about. Um, and yeah. then, you know, some people are, will, will go on, oh, well, what happens next? And it's like, well, you just test deeper. So you just start improving your soil deeper. So you're building deeper topsoil, which makes your soil more resilient. You, you know, you can hold more moisture. You're less, less prone to suffering from drought. Um, obviously, obviously, like uh, I think it was 2017 or 18, we really, really dry. And, you know, no matter how good your soil is, you're always going to have issues. But, yeah. you know, I was still producing food when – when all my neighbours were, their paddocks were browned off and looking awful, whereas I still at least was able to produce some food, yeah. uh, which was really, really cool. So, uh, so yeah, what, what was the difference in, 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 in your place to theirs? Obviously, the practices that you're doing, but, yeah. you know, how are some of the ways you can get carbon into, into the soil? You know, wh- yeah. what do you do? So the only way you get carbon into your soil is with a growing plant. Okay. Um, so what has to happen is you have to have the plant growing then what the plant does, it photosynthesis goes through a process called photosynthesis, which is yep. basically turning sunlight into energy, uh, which is in the form of sugar. So what? But in able, uh, in order for it to do it, it needs carbon. So the plant will absorb carbon in through its its leaf with yep. the help of sunlight. It will convert it to um, sugar, and but the plant will obviously absorb more carbon than it needs, and produ- then so what we'll do is they'll make like a carbon bank and store that in the soil. Yeah, because the plant knows that if there's more carbon around, then there's more microbes. So the key thing about um, microbes, why I keep talking about it, is yeah. because they're like the little powerhouse of the soil. Um, so what happens is then, so you've got a plant grown, it's absorbed a whole bunch of carbon. Well, what happens next? Well, then you have a cow or a goat or a kangaroo, whatever it, the livestock may be, come through and graze that plant off. And they cut it off, you know, down near the base of the root, um, and then the plant will release um, chemicals into its root because it's just being, you know, it's had its head chopped off and it needs wants to regrow. <laughs> so that will send messages down into its roots to attract um, microbes saying, like, you know, if you can go get me some nutrient, yeah. whether it be nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, or even micronutrients, um, I'm going to give you some sugar because I'm going to trade off all this sugar that I have left lying around um, for this nutrient to help me regrow. So then it will start the process all over again. So it will start sucking in more carbon producing um, to produce energy and then regrow. And then what you do is you have, say, I don't know, generally I like working on the idea of 150 head of cattle um, per hectare. So for a day or yeah. two days. And That's pretty intense. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. So you have them all on the, on the, on the um, paddock, for a day and then after they've grazed it all down um you move them on and then you leave that paddock for a, re- a rest for you know a couple of months two yeah. three months so then it can regrow and um then yet yeah, really start fixing your soil yeah okay 
I mean, yeah. So soil health is is really, really is really important. And I think, yeah, we were talking before about um, you know all the different things that microbes can do. Yeah, you know, uh, and the the difference I found at my place, I've got the just a small, yeah, you know, small town block, and the the difference that I've had in actually in, encouraging that microbial growth through my through my soil, actually breaking down the shale in my backyard. Just the joys of that little bit of little bit of topsoil and then shale that you, yeah. get, you get in all yeah. your housing estates. Yeah. But the, the difference it's made by actually, you know, mulching, you know, chop and drop what what I've been doing actually um you know build up that bit of biomass that's in, in the soil. Yeah. 100%. How, how the, the difference that that's made. Yeah, yeah. So basically once you get your soil carbon up to about four percent, um you'll start producing what's known as carbonic acid, which is um an acid which is breaks down rock. Yeah. Um, so then you can't start extracting nutrient out of rock. Um, you know, you see people going on about how, oh, we need to put rock minerals and rock dust and crusher dust or basalt dust on our paddocks to, you know, fertilise our paddocks because it's cheap and it does a really good job, but you just work on getting your soil carbon up. You're not even going to have to pay for that That's because it. there's just – you know, I don't know about your place, but I know my place is millions of little rocks in my attic. So yeah, <laughs> it's just I look at it as you know, free money sitting there, free fertilizer. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's pretty, it's pretty amazing what your soil can actually do. Uh, the microbes in your soil can do to help. Well, so much of it is just a, it's a mind shift. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that that mindset change. Yeah, and, and we're talking about the idea of how, um, you know, what you were saying over the. People you're getting coming through at Kandanga Farm Store where you're working, you know, is the idea of you know what people have been doing for generations. Have, having that new idea come through about how we can actually look at doing things in a more responsible way, definitely. You know, and, and I think that's really exciting. And um, one of the, one of the areas that we're looking at, the you know, I think a lot of our a lot of our listeners are talking about is is doing more things that they're doing themselves at home. There's the option of being able to do stuff. On a on a larger scale, yep. but at home, you know, there, there's so many different things you can you can do. And um, you know, we, we talk, my my kids. I remember when my kids were young, we started off the, the garden at at home as that bit of an experiment for for them and something to something to grow, grow them up. Yeah. But when I had three year old kids and I give them a bowl at night time and say go out and get salad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. You've got a generation of children who are growing up. There, you know, there's not there's not that that stereotypical. I won't eat my veggies, so you know, give them chicken nuggets and chips. Yeah. You know, that's not going on. There's there's that idea of kids are actually getting in and eating their veggies because they're seeing it grow and they're and seeing they're it made pride in it. Hundred percent. Yeah. You know, um, and and it feels better. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It feels yeah, better. It tastes better. Yeah. <laughs> feels better too. Why yeah. Not? Yeah. Of course. You know, you eating good food, you feel better. So. That's right. So yeah. <laughs> no, I I remember it. Um, while I was at uni, we did some stuff with kids and fussy eaters. Yeah, yeah. And I tell you, once a kid is in a habit of eating chicken nuggets and chips, it's so hard to break. Um, but yeah, it, so have, have they killed the have they killed their taste buds? Yeah, is uh, that really, look, they just kids, haven't developed them enough. Yeah, yes and no. So a young kid doesn't have like the reasoning ability to refuse food. That's why mm. you see, you know, I'm sure you've everyone's seen like YouTube videos of a parents giving their kids lemon, for example, and the kid takes a bite on it and they make that awful looking face and then takes another bite because they because they don't have that rationale just to say, that's disgusting, I'm not going to eat it. They just yeah. say, that's food, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat it. Yeah. So if you can form those, basically get the, the kid used to that, um, the kids used to those tastes, whether it be broccoli, you know, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts even, um, at a young age, they're going to, love those foods all the way growing up. Yeah. Um, it's just like my son, for example, he'll eat just about anything under the sun because we've from a basically since he started eating food, at, you know, about five months old, he's tasted just about every, everything and there's very, very few things that he won't eat now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just persistence. It's, um, it's and funny you say that about, you know, about the, the kids eating everything. My, uh, my, my kids will eat anything as well, but. Uh, my son, son in particular is he's just really developed this incredible palate um, of you know knowing what to add to foods to actually oh, increase yeah, the cool. flavor and you know, you know oh you're making dinner that just needs a little bit of this or it needs a little bit of that how cool is that it, it's it's unreal it's actually quite annoying to be honest this this tastes really really good no dad if you add that and like shut up man it's better now. So, <laughs> 
Yeah. No, that's actually really cool. That it, how old is he? Uh, he's uh, 13 now. Oh, but yeah, he's been doing that for the last couple of years. <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, a little smart ass. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, my, in, in terms of where things are at with, um, uh, with with your place and what you've been yep. what you've been doing, how you've been um, growing up. Yeah, what sort of things are you planning on doing in the future? Yeah, so my um, wife and I decided to um, we we were always running um, chickens to, for producing eggs, but as you know, only we had I don't know a handful of birds, you know, 50, 60 birds. Yeah, um, and as just that was for when we were at the farmers markets. You know, we could bring along I don't know, 30, 35 dozen eggs just to sell with that. Um, but my wife and I decided to do a bit of a trial this this year and grow up about 500 layers to see how we can handle it and if running it at a large scale like that was actually profitable and how we would cope. Um, so, yeah, we've got those that, you know, I think is a, everyone I'd say is like, oh, that's a lot of chickens. But in all reality, it's very, very small flock compared to some of the big big commercial operations out there. Um but, yeah, so we've been running that flock for now. Oh, they've been laying since um, just before Christmas. Um, and, yeah, so my wife and I are coping quite well. We're doing all the work ourselves. It's, you know, it's a lot of work, but at the end of the day, oh, I just love farming, um, so I'm happy to do it. So, but, yeah, we've, we're coping really well. So next year we're really hoping that we can ex- expand that flock up to about 2,500. Yeah. Um, and once we do that, become certified organic as well because there's plenty of people raising pasture-raised um, poultry, but I think there's a big gap for organic, pro- uh, organically produced eggs that are done on a you know relatively small scale, yeah. uh, and that can um, that aren't you know mass produced like some of the big operators that there are, which have you know hundreds of thousands of birds potentially. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so that's where we're going with the terms of the poultry. Um, I'm also at the moment looking at expanding um, the other livestock we've got running. Um, we've got a few house cows type things that are more so pets than anything yeah. um, that we're looking at, but I'm hope that um, yeah, to hopefully to get some fencing done and start running a bigger herd of cattle and incorporating some goats in there just to get that diversity of livestock as well because, you know, it, running goats and cattle together. The cows will eat one thing, the goats will eat another, and, you know, you just get diversity of animals and you just fix your land a whole lot quicker than if you were just running one one species. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so that's where we're going. And um, my long-term plan is um, putting in a big old orchard of peaches. So. Yeah, okay. But that's that's still a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a bit of country to fix first. Ah, fantastic. So Nick, you were talking about the fact that you know working at Kananga Farm Store, and a um, you know, uh, little, little bit about where um, you know, what you're actually doing there and things like that. You know, Kananga Farm Store is a great little place. Yep. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, bit about what's actually on offer in the shop and uh, yeah, yeah, what totally. you guys do? Yep. So we um, we do a whole range of things, whether it be uh, infrastructure projects for you know million acre farms or even just the one acre farm. Okay. Um, so we do. We can help you set up solar pumps. We can help you set up fences. Uh, we can help you with managing livestock for nutrition and uh, managing livestock, uh, getting better nutrition into your livestock, producing healthier livestock, uh, managing weeds, managing pests. Cover cropping is a big thing. We're we're really becoming known for at the moment. Yeah. So um, what's, what? What? Can you explain a bit more about cover, cover cropping? Yeah. Yeah. So cover crop. It's Essentially, growing an annual plant, which um, will help fix your soil. Because uh, so that's put the carbon back in, like yeah, we were saying. Well, not only carbon, but so you get you have a mixture of um, you have a mixture of like cereal, so that's like barley, oats, wheat, that kind of stuff, triticale, rye corn. Yeah. Um, then you plant them with a medic, like plantain or chicory, uh, and then along with a um, legume. So legumes are fantastic because what they do is they they form a symbiotic relationship with the rhizobium, in the, which is a microbe again. Yep. Um, and once the microbes, uh, sorry, once the the legume starts growing, they'll start extracting nitrogen from the atmosphere and depositing it in your soil. And I read one study that said that one per hectare of um, legume, you can fix up to two hundred and fifty kilos of 
get straight nitrogen into your soil. Wow. Which is, I've worked it out, like the equivalent of three quarters of a tonne urea. That's you amazing. Know, so, yeah, yeah. So, so by planting a plant, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so they add fertility into your soil as well. Um, so, yeah, it's diverse. There's a mixture of all plants. Like our winter mix that I designed has about 12 different species in, and they're all to work in combination with one another to uh, regenerate your soil. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they work by sending roots. So as well, a big component of it is um, plants with different size roots. Uh, so your cereal crops, for example, have very shallow roots, whereas yeah. we've got a um, the plantain and chicory in it, for example, will send the tap root down a metre and a half. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And then you so have. Really, you're really working a huge. Yeah, huge exactly. Level of that. Because those. So, what the benefit of that, the beauty of that, such a deep tap root is that it starts extracting nutrients from the subsoil, which many tropical grasses that grow around here have such shallow roots. Like they'll get the odd root that's a, you know, half a meter deep, but never, nothing. I've yet to see any tropical grasses get, you know, a meter and a half, two meter tap uh, root. Yeah. So, you know, you're extracting nutrients from so deep down in the soil, you're bringing moisture up that's in the subsoil um, that previously was unavailable and not only does it feed those plants, making them extremely drought hardy, it starts feeding the rest of the plants as well. Yeah. So you, you're, um, you're growing a diverse polyculture, which is more drought resistant, again, more, more um, resistance to pests as well, and... You know, it's an amazing feed for your livestock. Yeah, so, um, and that's really good. What you were saying about, you know, uh, when your neighbours before, when you know, through through droughts, when your neighbours yeah. neighbors, everything's dying off, but yours is still productive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just by doing these things differently. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's one of the biggest things when when um, becoming known for is our cover crop mix. Like last year, we sold oh, uh, for our summer mix, we sold close to ten ton or twelve ton of cover crop seed. Yeah. Um, which in the grand scheme of things I know isn't much, but prior to that, you know, I would have to go out and make my own mix yeah. and buy seed from different different shops, whereas now I can just, I not only, just, before I worked at the shop, I was a customer there as well, yeah. um, but now I can just pr- go to the, sh- the shop, get the bag of seed, throw it out and not have to worry about it. And so it's can just, everyone else too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Um and not only that, with the with the rural supplies and the you know the rural infrastructure that we can help you with, we you know we sell tanks and whatnot to anyone really, yeah, residential or acreage. Um, we've also Tim and Amber, the owners, of uh, now starting to run uh, manage the cafe. Um, yeah. It was previously um, leased out to another business, uh, but when COVID struck, you know, obviously with the restrictions in, they they couldn't continue, so. Um, it wasn't great time for, <laughs> to look for a, for a um a new business to take over. So Tim and Amber decided to run it. So now they're running it. Um, so they we the cafe is great because probably eighty percent, I would say at least, of the ingredients come from where we can source uh the food locally. So our yeah, menu, yeah. So the menu is always changing because we might have a customer who like. For instance, we had a customer call up a couple of weeks back and say, oh, I've got all these great persimmons, can you use them? And the chef was like, yeah, definitely, I can use them for something. So we, this, we had persimmons on the menu for a couple of weeks and yeah. then once the persimmons dried up, um, you know, now he's um, – now another grower was like, oh, I've got all these pomegranates. So now we've had pomegranates showcased on the menu for a while. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, it's really, really different in terms of – you hear a lot of cafes saying, oh, we're using seasonal and – local produce but you look at it they've got avocados growing on <laughs> they've got avocado avo smashed all yeah. year but in all honesty the yes avocados will be produced most of the year in the region but from about december to through to now there's avocados aren't being picked so yeah we've got one of our you know one of our favorite customers is he's about to um his avocados are ready to pick so we're going to have avo smash back on the <laughs> Oh, yeah. Back on the menu. People are going to be happy about that. Yeah, then. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so we're not, you know, obviously you can buy avocados that are produced in Western Australia or in or New Zealand all year, but, you know, we really are, Tim and Amber are really passionate about using food that's grown locally and um, seasonal. 
That's fantastic. I mean, that gives you a variety as well. Oh, Keeps it totally. interesting for people coming along, knowing that you know what, what, you come back next month, and it's going to be completely different. It's going yeah, to be, exactly. It's wonderful. Yeah. Like we've had, like I remember, I I um I spoke to a fella from Brisbane, and he goes, "Oh, I'm keen to come and try, eat at your your cafe, but I can't find a menu." And it was a really good opportunity to explain to him that you know, I don't know what's going to be on the menu on the weekend. Like I know it's going to be you know, lots of delicious food. Yeah. Um, and you obviously you get your staples like your bacon and eggs and your sausages and um, all that kind of stuff. But it really does change from week to week. So if we publish a, a menu for the public to see, it would just be outdated by <laughs> next week. So, and, yeah, they, were, they thought, oh, that's really cool. And they, I think they came. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> obviously it's a bit hard to gauge. But, yeah, so it was really cool to explain that to them and they really appreciated it. And um, yeah, we always get feedback about how great. Yeah, I remember when I went over there for lunch, and um, yeah, it was just simple, you know, toasted sandwich. But my God, it was a fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I still remember it, and the relish that was on there. Just yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah. I could and a lot of the ex- yeah, exactly, because a lot of the food that we use is produced by you know real artisan people that are passionate mm-hmm. about their their um trade, like the relish you were talking about was um. The fella's name's Peter Wolf, uh, Peter Wolf, and he goes out into Central Australia to forage for the bush tomatoes, for example. Oh, really? And, yeah, brings them back, turns them into relish. And, like, the bread um, is made by it's uh, Jeremiah's crust, and it's yeah. a slow ferment, and it takes her two days to break a loaf. Yeah, I remember, I remember Tim, Tim telling us about yeah, that. That was, that was an amazing phenomenal. story. So, yeah, yeah. So the food we're being produced is and we're using is all very artisan and you can taste the difference. It's not just, we don't have food trucks rocking up every other day, dropping off uh, food. Yes. That has been produced in a big factory. No, that's fantastic. So I think that's really a um, a wonderful, um, you know, wonderful part about that, that business and how, you know, it's, it's being run, you know, it's, it's being run really to, to serve, to serve locals, but also to do, to you know, make a difference as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's Tim talks about the circular economy all the time, and mm. um, you know, really helping regional Australia. So, you know, for example, the the avocado grower he buys his fertilizer office, and then we buy his avocados off him yeah. and use them in the cafe. And you know, he also has honey he produces on his farm because they need pollination. So we use buy the honey, and they're used in the in the um, cafe, and then you know. You're, can buy it in the shop so it's it really is a whole circular economy That's and that win for everyone ex- yeah exactly yeah. and then at the end of the day the consumer is the one who benefits most because they're getting really good produce really high quality produced food um and tastes great reasonable price and yeah it's fantastic that's fantastic so look nick um you know, going back to what we we're saying before about a lot of the listeners being you know people wanting to do stuff themselves and and whatnot you know, from with your background, yeah, you know, have you got any tips for what people can do themselves, you know, in their own backyard, with, even if it's a town block or yeah, yeah. it doesn't even have to be a large acreage or anything like yeah. that? Yeah, uh, <laughs> get rid of your lawn and start growing food. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because yeah. they just—I don't know. I've I've never been fan. I've never been a big fan on on lawns, but you know, I remember when we were living in, um, while I was at uni, uh, living in um, Caloundra there. We had a massive garden in our backyard. Like we lived on a four hundred square meter block, but still we produced stacks of. Yeah, it's amazing how much you can do in a oh, small area. Phenomenal, and like because it's just so intense. Like because you have a you have a lettuce plant planted underneath a tomato yeah tr- uh, bush, and you know you're producing the tomato is shading the lettuce from the sun, and you know you're producing lettuce, and then you've got your cucumbers growing next to it, providing mulch for the like a living mulch for the lettuce and the and the tomato. And then you've got a salad right there, you know, you've basically got a Greek salad there sitting there in your garden and you just go pick it. So, yeah, <laughs> so I'd say, it's, yeah, get rid of your lawn and plant some it's, tomatoes. It's interesting, actually, the, the lawn idea, um, the idea of a lawn itself. Uh, I don't know if you know about the history of the lawn, where the lawn came from. Uh, well, um, I think I'm pretty sure it was the English that, that started off. Yeah, the idea, everybody had the, um, had the, the backyard food because that's where you, you grew your veggies, that's yeah, where you grew your yeah. fruit. So that was one of those things. The idea of the lawn actually came as a symbol of status. Yeah, right. It was a symbol of status that I don't need to grow my own fruit and veggies. I don't need to grow all this. I, I, I have people who do this for me. 
So the lawn actually became a status status symbol, and it's just it's continued and been perpetuated across that now. You know, we have prize winning lawns. <laughs> so that's really funny. Yeah, um, but yeah. So you know, um, another tip I could I could use is um, you know just read up about companion planting. You know, mm. planting things that grow well together. So. Uh, like plant garlic next to your tomatoes because the garlic will help repel bugs, or plant basil next to your garlic because they just they you know they just love growing next to each other. Yeah. Um, and yeah, look at um, I'm happy to have a chat to anyone as well because yeah. obviously people are different situations, but um, we can really tailor advice to you as well. But you know, just companion planting is a big one, but the biggest thing is just get out there and do it. Yeah. Um Give you it a learn go. exactly. You learn while you go. Um if you have a failure, yeah, that's okay. I've had heaps of failures on my farm and you just it's, learn from them and you it just builds up compost then. Yeah, well so, <laughs> exactly. Nothing goes to waste. That's right. You know, I've had whole crops just, you know, ruined and haven't grown properly because oh I need to fertilize them different or I need to yeah. water them different. And then next year I've grown the same ones and they're just fantastic. Um so, yeah, basically just get out there and do it. Uh, you know, YouTube's a great resource. There's Unreal. lots of yeah. people talking about home gardens and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, just, you know, get rid of your lawn. Uh, get out there and do it. Yeah, just start planting. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, if you, you know, whether you've got, a, you know, a million acres or 100 square metres in your backyard, you can still grow cover crops to improve your soil. So, mm. If you want to start, but you don't, you know, you're not ready to start. Come buy some cover crop seed and throw it out in your backyard, water it, and then you'll have, you know, all this great uh, biomass growing above ground. You chop it down, then you buy, a, you grow some tomato seedlings, and just plant them straight into it, and you've got, you know, really, you're going to be producing really, really great tomatoes That's right. or anything. Um, Doesn't have to be a lot of work. No, exactly. No. Yeah, no, I'm a lazy farmer. So. <laughs> <laughs> I try and do things as, as most efficiently as possible. So that's it. It's, that's it. it's efficient. It's not lazy. Oh, uh, well, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's one of those things. That, you know, we're obviously going to put all the the details for getting it, be able to, how you can get into contact with Kendanga Farm yeah. Store and whatnot into the episode notes, uh, and also having links throughout the various media channels yeah, cool. and whatnot. So, Nick, what I'm gonna, I'm going to be doing with all my guests is a six questions in sixty seconds, the six in sixty, mate. So, what we need to do is we need ni- nice, short, sharp answers because we've only got sixty seconds right. to get through all six of them. All right. So, uh, you ready to go? Yep. Let's go. Okay. So, what's a personal habit that tri- that can, you contribute to your success? I work really hard. I what? just get out, see something to be done, and get out and do it. I- yeah. Fantastic, mate. What's the What's the best advice you've ever received? Uh, probably from my dad, which was, um, youth is wasted on the young. So I nice. took that. Yeah. And, you know, I really took that in, like, I have lots of energy, obviously. And I just get out there and, you know, do it. I studied hard at uni. I worked hard at uni. I took that advice. Yeah. Really on board too. I like that one. What's the one thing that you're most fired up about today? Um, probably the widespread overuse of synthet- uh, synthetic fertilizers and chemicals and all that stuff and, you know, the rhetoric that to produce food and agriculture needs to have synthetics. All right, excellent. So um, w- w- if you could recommend one book or podcast to our listeners, what would that be and why? Um, I would probably say uh, Water for Every Farm by P.A. Yeomans. Uh, it's a relatively old book, but when I read it, it I really looked – it changed how I looked at um, – the landscape of my farm and um you know because of it i now um rather than water washing off and running off into creeks and that you know it's being absorbed into the ground fantastic okay and uh what personal goals are you hoping to achieve in the next 12 months uh yeah again just expanding the farm yep um you know becoming basically the ultimate goal is to work towards full-time farming but uh yeah just expanding the farm looking at different avenues Fantastic. Okay, and the last one, if animals could talk, <laughs> which one would be the rudest and why? 
Uh, I gotta say, it's probably the chickens. The chickens. You get some nasty chickens, eh? <laughs> Attitudes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They, the, some of those girls are just so nasty to other girls. So Unreal. I would say probably the chickens. Bitchy chickens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, fantastic, mate. Well, look, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for coming along today. My and um, yeah, is, is there anything that that uh, we maybe didn't didn't uh, hit on today that you wanted to have a chat about at all? No, we covered a lot about. Know, growing food sustainably and um, regeneratively and you know, putting back into soil, which is what I'm really passionate about. Um, yeah, just if you want more info, just come on down and see me at, at the Kandanga Farm Store. I'm happy to have a chat to you about anything. Mate, that's fantastic. And look, we're obviously going to have all the details for the Kandanga Farm Store again on our social channels and on the uh, in, in the show notes for this episode. Uh, Nick, thank you very much for your time. Um, we want to also want to thank uh, Kandanga Farm Store for letting you come along oh, to have a chat with us no as well, and um, to give them a bit of a uh, yeah, bit, bit of a plug for us. And mate, we really do appreciate Nick Sicardi. Thank you so much, mate. My pleasure, guys. Thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. What a great conversation that was. Nick, thanks a lot for coming along, mate. We really appreciate it. To all you listeners out there, I'm glad you enjoyed it because I'm sure you did. Anyway, I look forward to talking to you next time. Take care.